now move to our keynote speakers. Uh, Ambassador Uriola, please. Thank you so much, um, Mr. President, Mr. Chairperson, um, distinguished parliamentarians, um, ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, my first event after starting in this current job was to address the special debate on uh, protracted conflicts uh, at your winter session in Vienna in February. And as I mentioned then, I greatly appreciate the Parliamentary Assembly's engagement across the OSCE agenda. So um, allow me really to thank you for the invitation to join uh, this very timely discussion today. I mean, I think your work in the current challenging circumstances is just, let's say, more necessary than ever. And of course, it's also a pleasure uh, to be talking um, to you in the virtual company of uh, the Chief Monitor of the SMM, Ambassador Chevika. I will touch on a couple of points related to Ukraine, but uh, will keep my focus more on the impact of the current pandemic on other conflicts uh, in the OEC region and on, on some wider issues. Now, the crisis has had, understandably, a disruptive effect on overseas activities and operations, uh, including related to the conflicts in the OSC region. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, the crisis and its indirect effects uh, can have um, and are having a heavy impact on conflict affected populations uh, who are already enduring uh, precarious conditions. Uh, the closure of crossing points or entry exit points um, and other restrictions on movement are affecting them. Uh, reduced access to health care and other services, as well as the impact of uh, wider economic difficulties, uh, plays a heavy burden on already vulnerable populations. And as an example of uh, reaction to these unfortunate consequences, uh, the co-chairs of the Geneva International Discussions, uh, GID, with a special representative, Michalka, of the Albanian chairmanship, who represents the OSCE. Um, they have strongly urged all GIT participants to set aside differences and to refrain from actions that could lead to increased tension. Now, this was also in reference to the restrictions that have resulted in a full halt of uh, freedom of movement across the conflict divides, adding to the isolation and vulnerabilities of the conflict affected population. While emergency medical evacuations through the respective administrative boundary lines have been allowed, they seem to be the exception rather than the rule. And staying on this example uh, for the moment, uh, so-called borderization activities on the administrative boundary lines have also resurfaced. The timing and the mere fact of additional obstacles to people's livelihoods has led to additional tensions and could play out negatively in the future. And the co-chairs have also reacted to this and, and raised the issue in their regular consultations. And Really, unfortunately, the call by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on the 23rd of March for a global ceasefire, uh, as well as the OSC reiteration of this important message, to which, of course, uh, members of this assembly joined as well, uh, it has just not led to much positive difference on the ground. Uh, there is an urgent need for ceasefires and for all sides in conflicts in our common area to focus on solidarity and cooperation to confront the pandemic. The second obvious impact is on the various formats related to the conflicts. Uh, the crisis has disrupted meetings and prevents the direct and informal interactions, which are essential for securing progress in any mediation process. It also risks diverting attention and resources away from formal negotiation and resolution processes. Now, Ambassador Chevik will be covering Ukraine in some detail, so I won't dwell on that, except to note my admiration for the resilience that the SMM has shown in continuing its work in these very difficult circumstances. And I, I would note our deep concern at the continuing restrictions on uh, the SMM's freedom of movement, uh, because they really threaten the ability of the uh, SMM to do its job in eastern Ukraine. But let me also note that the trilateral contact group and its four working groups uh, on security, political, humanitarian and economic issues are now meeting exclusively in a video conferencing format. But importantly, they are keeping the same rhythm as before. 
And discussions have continued to focus on the measures set out by the Normandy Four leaders in December. There have been some encouraging steps, uh, such as the further exchange of detainees on, on the 16th of April. But the commitment made during the Paris uh, N4 summit for a full and comprehensive implementation of the ceasefire has yet to materialize. And fulfillment of this commitment would be a crucial element in furthering progress, not least in this difficult time of the pandemic. And as for other formats dealing with conflicts in the OSC area, they, they have been more disrupted. Uh, the Transnistrian settlement process has been heavily affected by the pandemic. Uh, the mission to Moldova and Special Representative Thomas Marharding uh, remain active, though, very active, in fact. Contacts continue on issues such as medical supplies and uh, the visit uh, of a WHO mission to Tiraspol last week. And such cooperation is encouraging. Um, but, however, uh, the um, regular working groups and meetings between the chief negotiators of the sides, uh, the so-called one plus one, have been discontinued and uh, there is little um, evidence of agreement on moving to a wider meeting in the five plus two format. And the pandemic has influenced the Geneva international discussions as well. Uh, there are no clear indications as to when the discussions could be resumed. Uh, the associated incident prevention and response mechanisms, um, they already faced challenges before and uh, their resumption would be even more crucial now. Uh, but I would say more positively that there is still a clear commitment to the process by the participants of the GID. The uh, OSCE co-chair, Ambassador Michalka, together with the EU and UN co-chairs and their teams, uh, remains in close contact on a bilateral basis with all GID participants. And in fact, communication between the participants has intensified. Uh, and that, that is a reminder that we have to focus not only on the difficulties, but also to seek better opportunities to engage. Uh, part of the OSC's effort on this has focused on facilitation across contact divides on humanitarian issues, especially for the most vulnerable and the basis of trust that has been built within the GID framework uh, seems to have generated perspectives for cooperation across the conflict divide. This positive dynamic may actually strengthen the GID format. Ladies and gentlemen, the um, international attention and support remains crucial in another context in the South Caucasus as well. And that is uh, the OSC Minsk group co-chairs who spearhead those efforts are now relying on remote mediation and maintaining communication between the sides. Unfortunately, the positive dynamics uh, that were created in the meeting of the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers at the beginning of this year seem to be slowed down simply because it is impossible to hold face-to-face -face meetings at the moment. But in this situation, the foreign minister's joint statement of the 21st of April after a video teleconference uh, and under the auspices of the co-chairs was particularly welcome. It was an important signal that the process is active and that the efforts of the co-chairs are met with engagement from the sides despite challenges posed by the pandemic. The uh, monitoring activities of the personal representative of the OSC chairperson in office, Ambassador Kasperzik, are currently on hold, as are other agreed confidence building measures. Meanwhile, the situation on the ground remains relatively stable, but uh, it does deserve continued close attention and engagement. And as always, the OSC stands ready to support the sites where necessary and, of course, where desired by them. If I may move to uh, the wider work of the field operations. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, the current crisis has had a significant impact on the work of the OC, and including the field operations, which have actually moved mostly to telecommuting to ensure the safety and health of their staff. But let me emphasize that they continue to work actively. In fact, most have provided short-term crisis support to the host authorities, and they are looking for ways to respond to medium-term needs related to response and recovery, while uh, also keeping their mandates and existing planned activities very much in focus. Uh, some of the programmatic work uh, that the OSC is conducting uh, and focusing on economic and environmental aspects in particular does and will further contribute to recovery efforts. 
And personally, I am proud of how well the organization has been able to respond to the pandemic and its effects. And I have to emphasize within the mandates of our field operations and the overall mandate of the OSCE. And this response uh, will be important in helping to ease the severe economic impact of the crisis uh, in many of our countries, as, as well as, of course, the potential social and indeed political consequences. And as was already mentioned, I mean, we do need to be alert to the risks. Uh, at its worst, this kind of disruption uh, to not only health, but to the wider social and economic order has the potential to fuel tensions and conflict within and between countries. Um, the risks associated with minority communities, a possibly disproportionately weakened position uh, or adverse targeting within societies uh, should also be kept in mind in this context. And all of this underlines the importance uh, of the OSC's early warning functions and the parliamentary assembly's input on potential early warning signals, in particular when it comes to possible threats to democratic governance and parliamentary oversight as well as flagging a possibly increased frustrations in society in relation to COVID-19 are very important. But not just to be bleak, um, we should consider the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to promote new tools for enhanced interaction, as you are doing with this webinar. Um, when in-person meetings cannot take place, digital tools do offer viable alternatives. And, and uh, apart from uh, the uh, parliamentary assembly doing this, contacts and some of the negotiations are currently being held this way. And we will continue uh, to explore possibilities offered by digital interaction. But it is important uh, to bear in mind uh, that, well, the importance of trust building and the strengthening of uh, interpersonal relations in negotiations is something that um, is difficult to do via internet. Uh, the risks and opportunities of digital tools need to be carefully weighed. Uh, but given that the COVID-19 restrictions may, may be long lasting, mediators will need to increase the digital literacy of the mediation teams. Uh, COVID-19 uh, also has important implications for governance and democratic control of security actors uh, due to the emergency measures that are being uh, put into place and which often lead to increased powers for the executive. Uh, this development uh, was pointed out during your recent webinar uh, devoted to emergency situations and democratic control. And so maintaining oversight and accountability, as well as the rule of law and compliance with civil liberties by the security sector in this kind of situations is important. And of course, the promotion and sustaining of effective governance strengthens resilience and stability within societies. Now, to conclude, um, yes, this crisis is having an impact on the conflicts, on the civilian populations that are affected by them and on the various formats addressing to address them. And unfortunately, the already difficult conditions for people affected by conflict seem to have been generally worsened. Conflict resolution has become harder and the progress on the efforts has slowed. But right now we need to focus on encouraging, encourage uh, cooperation on joint humanitarian efforts. And we are seeking a step change in the use of digital tools for sustaining mediation efforts and in fact, some of these may use uh, or rather offer useful tools and practices even after normal business has resumed. But what can we do? We should all continue to build on the opportunities, even under the current difficult uh, circumstances. And the Parliamentary Assembly and, and you have made, and I am sure will continue to make an important contribution to our common efforts. So I will end with that and thank you for this cooperation. very much, Ambassador. We really appreciate you joining us uh, today and thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation. I'm sure there will be uh, very, uh, very interesting interventions later in the debate and also good questions for you. Uh, and, uh, and now, Ambassador Uyola, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me actually try to answer the two last questions. One of them, whether satisfied with the governments working together and, and uh, then um, will it be easier to continue or be more difficult in conflict resolution? 
I mean, first of all, the OSCE, I think, has been remarkably nimble in finding ways to keep the dialogue ongoing, um, even during the, this time of pandemic and lockdown. And uh, I have to say that the Albanian chairmanship has been able to really make sure that we continue discussions at the Permanent Council, in the committees and so forth. And, and of course, um, <laughs> the Parliamentary Assembly is keeping the active dialogue going on. And at the same time, um, all the field operations, as I said earlier, continue to work to implement their mandates, uh, even under the uh, challenging circumstances. And here I really want to say that it's 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 also about prevention of conflicts and crisis, because that is cheaper than resolving them. And each field mission in countries where there is no ongoing conflict as well is supporting the resilience of the host country. And, and of course, in the current circumstances, first of all, responding to the immediate crisis, but also to maintain the sustainable and resilient development of the states and societies, socially, economically, and politically. And after the most acute pandemic situation is overcome, as we've discussed today, we will all be faced with serious economic consequences. And, and so really sustainable political stability will be very important. And that's where democracy, uh, rule of law, good governance uh, come into play. And, and uh, there, the role of the parliamentary assembly is so important. You parliamentarians are the guardians of this. So I really have high appreciation for your work. And as to will it be easier for conflict resolution processes? I think the answer is really that it depends on how much cooperation and confidence building uh, the current crisis generates. Uh, humanitarian initiatives were mentioned as important, and uh, they can not only support the vulnerable populations in the conflict ridden areas, but they also function as uh, confidence building measures. So I do hope and I am hopeful that in some instances there is more trust built between the conflict sides when everybody has to act together to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. So let's hope that there's something good comes out of this as well. I will leave it there and thank you so much for allowing me to participate in the debate. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you very much concluded in that optimistic note. We really appreciate your your time and your presence in our